Hello, I'm Bob Denton, and welcome to another conversation. Well, the Commonwealth Alliance for Rural Colleges has a rich history of providing access to colleges for students in rural and agricultural regions in Southside and Southwest Virginia. Carthen Curran is president of the Alliance, and he joins me to share the mission, goals, and opportunities provided by the Commonwealth Alliance for Rural Colleges. And thank you so much for joining the conversation. Thank you, Bob. Pleasure to be here. Well, first of all, tell us about the uh, Alliance. The Alliance was established in 1965. Um, it's a com consortium, or I use the term, uh, one of our presidents, Dr. Huxman, likes to use the term that we are a constellation of institutions that have similar histories and are, are in rural Virginia. And that's, the, that's, that's where we began in 1965. At the time we began, these institutions, uh, four of the five of the institutions were junior colleges that later evolved into four-year institutions. And when you uh, talk about it, um, what is the mission of the Alliance? Well, the mission is twofold. One, to raise financial resources that go to um, our students to help them with scholarship support, financial support. The other is, since I took over, is to create a greater awareness. Um, this program is a good example of that, creating awareness of these institutions that are anchored in rural Virginia, their importance not only in their communities, but indeed in the higher ed equation for the Commonwealth. And another aspect of this awareness is that we, the Alliance, are looking for unique partnerships, and we can talk about one of those now if you would like. We have a new partnership with Virginia Commonwealth University. We call it the Gupton Initiative. And in essence, it's to take our best chemistry majors and let them go through this graduate program at VCU to become chemical engineers. It's an incredible opportunity for our students. It connects a urban, one of the largest urban universities in the Commonwealth with five rural uh, colleges that are in Southwest, Southside, Virginia, and the Valley. So it's, it's one of those unique opportunities that I'm trying to uh, double up. Uh, we're in the process of having some initial discussions with George Mason, which is apparently interested in being more involved in rural Virginia. So that seems to be a natural potential alliance uh, as well. So um, you've been president for a couple of years. Right. What drew you to this particular organization? <clears throat> well, number one, I'm a graduate of one of the five institutions. In my case, Ferrum College. I'm a proud Ferrum Panther. Uh, I was on the board of directors for about 10 years. And then about seven years ago, I was elected as chair of the board. Uh, and during that process, I. Uh, oversaw the first strategic plan that the organization had ever had, and that was our 50th anniversary. And since then, I've been in other uh, public service roles and local governments across the Commonwealth. And when this position became open, I had some friends on the board to suggest that I look at this. And I've always felt a real passion for the organization, for what it represents, and for all the good that it's done for over half a century for a lot of students that perhaps otherwise would not have had an opportunity for a college education. Well, let's uh, talk a little bit about the mission in a little bit greater detail. Um, how would you say is the core mission of the Alliance? The core mission is to bring to bear financial support um, that goes into what I shared earlier, scholarship support. Not just that, we, monies can be, and we've raised monies that go to different projects. Sometimes they're mortar, brick and mortar kinds of projects, but for the most part, it's for scholarship support. And in your statement in terms of mission, do provide access to an affordable value-based education. What does that mean, value-based education? Well, our schools, outside the, the law school, we are faith-based institutions. Uh, each of the f uh, four, again, uh, separated in the law school, were founded by religious denominations. So having uh, that faith base in our roots, I think, talks about our views on integrity and, and hard work and those types of great values that we, we embrace. As any, in, a, in a liberal arts 
education uh, format. And so we'll talk about the members in just a moment, but when you say in terms of the religious kind of format, um, it, it's not just a particular denomination in terms of where these uh, started. So it's not like a Protestant Catholic or what have you, but when you say value and, and faith-based, broadly defined, is that correct? Right, broadly defined, yes, absolutely. Um, well, and, you know, mm -hmm. the, the fact is in Virginia, nearly all the prophets in the Commonwealth were founded by religious uh, denominations. And one Hampton of the Sydney was a Presbyterian school. Uh, Virginia Wesleyan and Virginia Beach, a Methodist school. Emory Henry University, a Methodist, uh, et cetera. So. You also, um, in your um, core values, you say that you want to serve persons from low to moderate income households and first generation. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that is kind of the target audience uh, for the Alliance. And, and it, right, if you look at data that can be supplied by the Council of Independent Colleges, we, our schools do a better job than most, nearly all the publics in respect to first generation, uh, low income, minority base. Uh, we are doing a wonderful job in that arena. And we've been doing it for a long time. This is not just some, because it's fashionable to, to do those things, we our core mission has been to help educate, and, and most in the early part of our school's history is really reaching out to the communities, the, in the immediate area of these institutions. Fairham was founded by the United Methodist Women because in 1913, the road system in Western Franklin County, Floyd County, Henry County, Patrick County was such. Uh, it was very limited public education opportunities, and and. Uh, the Methodist women, the United of Virginia, decided we're going to do something about it. And that's, that's the origins of Nail Fairham College over a century ago. Well, let's identify um, these members. Um, share with us. Happy to. We, uh, current. Averett, Averett University in Danville. Now, you would say Danville's not rural, but th the neighborhood is very rural. So um, Appalachia School of Law, Grundy, Buchanan County. Bluefield University in Bluefield, Virginia, Tazewell County, uh, Eastern Mennonite University, just on the outside uh, border of Harrisonburg, and then Ferrum College in Franklin County. And um, these are all private schools, as you say, right. with religious kind of, uh, of history. I have to say and confess, and this is my own ignorance, um, a couple of these, I, I don't know that I really knew that they had a, a religious background, uh, like Bluefield College or Everett University mm -hmm. um, or Ferrum College, I I really didn't didn't uh, realize that. That's a distinct um, um, group of uh, diverse group of universities, but they have common profiles that I found interesting that that is shared. Ninety-two percent of enrollments receive financial aid. Fifty-seven mm -hmm. percent low to moderate income families, 28% minorities, 55% females, and 31% first generation. Mm -hmm. And so while it's a diverse group of schools, it also um, clearly as private schools have a lot in common. Indeed. Um, of course, I was impressed with the rankings of, the, uh, of some of these schools, um, especially with the U.S. Uh, news rankings. <coughs> Um, when you look at them as regional universities in the South, Averitt's 24th, um, Eastern Mennonite 34th, Ferrum 51, Bluefield 103. I mean, those are strong ratings in terms of quality in the region. Indeed. And, you know, there are small schools, and having the Ferrum experience, um, for me, it was very important to have that small class ratio. Uh, and having a real strong relationship with your faculty member. And, um, uh, in fact, uh, such a strong relationship that I've had friendships with past faculty that, I, that taught me over four, close to 35 years ago that are still good friends. So it's that kind of connection that I think you find at a small private liberal arts school. It certainly was in my case. I also found it impressive in some of the rankings in terms of as social mobility. Bluefield number three, Ferrum 31, Everett 34, Eastern Mennonite 
65. And that shows right there th that when you can go through and graduate, that you can succeed in, uh, in life. And so those rankings were impressive to me. Absolutely. Well, there's a member of the governor's cabinet, I'm proud to say. He's one of my closest friends who's a Ferrum alum, the Secretary of Labor uh, for the Commonwealth, Brian Slater. And also, um, Everett was rated uh, 10 best for veterans. And so mm -hmm. I was also very much impressed, impressed <coughs> by that. Um, so when I look at and think about the private sector and private schools, they're so expensive. Um, the average for those six schools, 36,000, full cost of attendance is $48,000. That's quite a bit. The average assistant grant is 24,000, and the average endowment of these schools are about 30 million. Um, that is very, very um, expensive. Um, if one were to tell us about operationally, you raise funds, do each of the schools receive a certain amount each mm -hmm. year? And is it dedicated toward and specified it must be used in terms of <coughs> Tell us a little bit about well, our, uh, operational aspects. Sure, in our situation, our bylaws uh, state uh, that 75% of the monies we raise is equally distributed to mm -hmm. the member institutions. It's 25% of the money is based on your enrollment. So that does alter between the institutions. Um, most of our money, not all of it, is, is earmarked for students, underprivileged students, students in need. So uh, to my earlier comment, uh, the great bulk of our money that I distribute at our annual meeting in June goes to support uh, scholarships to help offset that tuition uh, figure that you mentioned earlier, to make, us, to make us more competitive with Virginia Tech, Radford, Longwood, et cetera. Um, six in the group? Five. Five, five, five in the group, I'm yes. sorry. Um, and um, do you anticipate and you want some growth adding institutions? Of course, you already mentioned one kind of collaboration and two possible with other universities. But do you have a goal in mind of, of <coughs> um, bringing in other institutions? We, I, I don't want to go into great detail about that today, but at some future opportunity, we would love to maybe expand upon that. But yes, I'm looking for, we have a candidate in mind, uh, another institution that would uh, round us out at six. And those, uh, those conversations are ongoing, and I feel at this juncture positive about the ultimate outcome that this institution would, would join our group. But uh, can't go into too much more detail than that. Oh, darn, I thought we could make news today, but I don't <laughs> guess we will. <laughs> well, Virginia Tech's decided to join there us. There you go, all this. right. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so in terms of um, the source of the funds, you raise money. Share where and how and kind of the sources of the funds. Be happy to. Mo the vast majority, of, ma the majority of our funds come from foundations. Mm. Uh, for example, the Community Foundation here in Rondo uh, could be a potential candidate. Uh, corporations, foundations are our biggest uh, funding sources. Of course, individuals, um, some grants that we uh, are going for. I'm being more robust in how we look at our fundraising uh, opportunities, for example, I'm proud to say that the Commonwealth Alliance received a $100,000 planning grant from the organization that's Go Virginia. And that money uh, is money of the Commonwealth that is administered by the Department of Community Housing Development. That planning grant, Bob, is going to help the Gupton, the Gupton Initiative that I uh, would be happy to expand upon that our relationship with VCU. This is four of our undergraduate institutions working with Dr. Frank Gupton at, M at VCU to bring our best chemistry majors to flow through his graduate program at VCU, a master's or doctoral program, 
to ultimately get a chemical engineer degree. And that's a, a degree that's very sought after. Our graduates would have immediate, immediate jobs uh, that would be well paid and really place them in a good opportunity. So that's, that's a, the kind of things of, of we are looking to, to expand. And again, the Commonwealth support of what we did by providing us $100,000 was a big move for us. And so in this initiative that you're just talking about now, that's a pipeline. Correct. And are the, it's, um, it, how, is it limited by number? In other words, is there articulation of yes. they well, will agree to take X number? Yes, sir. I mean, they'll, it's, first of all, uh, getting a PhD in chemical engineering is no small feat. <laughs> I can't probably spell chemical engineering, <laughs> but yeah, it's a very tough, tough curriculum. But in our case, it is a pipeline issue, and we would be starting off small, probably two or three uh, young folks and our chemistry majors per school at the outset. But it's a beginning, mm -hmm. and it's, a, it's something that's, I think, uh, somewhat unique in the sense that VCU has not typically been engaged with small little mm -hmm. uh, colleges in the hinterlands of Virginia, but uh, we're making that work. So now, what would you say to someone that says, wow, I mean, that's impressive that a 50,000 a year tuition can be cut down to 24,000. But if you gave it instead of institutions, but to individual students that could go to a private school, you would actually impact more students if there was an application through the Alliance. Well, it, the structure is what it's been for over half a century, and I, the, the institutions are happy with that structure. We, we, we kind of are just an additional cheerleader to what they're doing themselves individually. Uh, you know, there's an old saying, there's strength in numbers. And so putting this alliance together, really uplifting the presence of these institutions is almost as good as having a dollars come to them as well. So we're, we're doing both. And, and I think they're very pleased with that. Um, and I'm assuming that as you go forward in whatever schools you may be thinking about, it's primarily to stay within the private sector, private yep. schools. Yes, sir, I would think so, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And geographically, as you mentioned. We, yes, the sixth candidate that we're talking with is also in a rural part of Virginia. Mm -hmm. Now, you have one professional association, which is the um, uh, Appalachian School of Law. Yes, sir. Are there, um, talk a little bit about that in terms of the professional as part of that, but is that another road that you might go looking at professional schools as well? Uh, that, that is possible. It's been mentioned uh, to me that you know, just down the street from, or up the street from where the law school is, the, is the Appalachian School of Pharmacy. So mm -hmm. that, that could be another opportunity on the professional basis that you mentioned. The law school happens to have, uh, Appalachian School of Law has uh, matriculation agreements with each of the four undergraduate institutions. So FARM, there's an agreement between uh, students that want to go to law school that they have a, a path there but so I'm helping strengthen that relationship between the law school and R4. Um, you, you certainly have a, an impressive board of the Alliance. Characterize and, and share some of the nature and context of the board. Well when I took this position I, I wanted uh, to use my relationships. I've been blessed with knowing a lot of folks in the Commonwealth and working with a lot of wonderful people. But uh, we have some, all our board members are, are wonderful and they've all been very, very supportive of where I'm trying to take the organization. But uh, for your viewing audience or some locals that might be of interest, Elizabeth McClanahan, who's a former member of the Supreme Court of Virginia, is now the president of the Virginia Tech Foundation. She is on my board. Uh, former First Lady Jeannie Bliles, who has a life, lifetime of support of literacy and education, is on my board. Uh, former Secretary of Technology, Karen Jackson, who served several governors in that role, she's on my board. And uh, we have 
several board members from Roanoke, uh, Mr. Lee Osborne of Woods Rogers, Brad Hall of American Electric Power, and Roy Butcher of Lonsford Insurance. So we have a good core of folks in Western Virginia uh, that serve on our board currently. Um, so when you um, look at your structure too, the presidents of each of those institutions are on your executive committee. Correct. And, um, and so the rationale of that, I mean, that's kind of like, um, is that for advice and consent? Or <laughs> what, 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 what role do they play in? Well, let's just say they're the customer. They represent the customer, uh, the institutions that I work for. So that's the primary reason that they serve on the executive committee. And uh, they're the leaders of these schools individually. And so uh, having them collectively on the executive committee is helpful for me because they're, they're battling. You know, we, we came out of COVID. Uh, it was a, an incredibly challenging time for everybody, mm -hmm. but especially for small private schools in rural Virginia. But I'm proud to say our institutions were incredibly resilient during that crisis. Uh, but the fact that they're on there, it gives me an opportunity again to hear firsthand their challenges and helps me understand how to best position where the alliance can be helpful for them. So it's important to have that communication back and forth. Well, we have uh, four minutes or so kind of remaining. Look ahead. If you said the next three things that you would like to accomplish, share those. What, what, is, what well, are the uh, things you would like to accomplish? We talked, touched on one, which is to add this other institution. I think continuing to build relationships with other institutions, public. Virginia Tech is on my to-do list, uh, along with George Mason, uh, I mentioned. We already have this relationship with Virginia Commonwealth University. And I think it's also an opportunity to let the General Assembly of Virginia know that private higher education is a critical part of Virginia's economy. Mm -hmm. uh, the large publics get a lot of attention, as they should, but there's a lot of opportunities our schools collectively represent millions of dollars in capital uh, and payroll, uh, uh, also faculty, employment. So they are part of the engine that makes the economy grow in Virginia. And it's very important in terms of Southwest and Southside um, Virginia. Um, obviously, proportionally, um, less percentage goes to generally go to college um, than some of the other regions with, across the common. Mm -hmm. And so, um, as you say, that big purpose is moderate to low, focusing on first generation, and to make it more accessible. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, and would you say that um, as we think about, about the future, um, in terms of the growth, you, you see that uh, it's difficult in recruiting an environment that we're in right now in terms of generally. You mentioned about the pandemic and oh my goodness. Um, and yet in some ways, smaller privates um, had a little bit better handling that and also in terms of performance than some of the larger places right. like Virginia Tech. Right. It was right. really difficult. Right, it was. Well, you know, when you're small in that uh, way, you can be more nibbled, a little bit more uh, flexible and and of course you smaller numbers and uh, probably helps that situation too so if you look at the we have a couple of minutes or so remaining if you look at how can the legislature what legislation what would you like to see Commonwealth of Virginia do in terms of the relationship with private or in terms of your well, alliances I think number one I think there's opportunities for my privates to in some cases, align themselves with some publics, universities, to go after some joint money through the budgetary process, through the General Assembly. Uh, Avery University recently received a million eight from the General Fund. How did they do that? They were in conjunction with Danville Community College, which in a sense is a state agency. So it was a joint project that the state and private institutions in Danville were working together. It was an aviation uh, grant. Uh, Abert has an aviation major. 
and uh, it was connected to working with Danville Community College. So that's an example. Mm -hmm. And another example, I guess, is the freedom to, uh, with the lab school initiative that right. the governor has talked about, because you don't have to be a public to participate right. in that. Right, exactly. Well, you certainly, the Alliance has been uh, 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 56 years, it's been helping in terms of the region, and it's very important for Southside and Southwest. And so I congratulate you and, and thank you for your, for your work and efforts on that. Thank you, Bob. Well, that's all the time we have. I want to thank my guest, Carthen Curran of the Commonwealth Alliance for Rural Colleges. And of course, I want to thank you for joining us and hope you do so again for the next edition of Conversations with me, Bob Denton.